We are drawing towards the end of our series on the environment. Uh, and we're approaching it, as you know, by looking at uh, some of the headings from the Westminster Confession of Faith and seeing what light the doctrines that are uh, the doctrines of Scripture laid out for us in that confession, uh, what light they can shine for us onto this contemporary subject, very, uh, very hot topic today, of the environment. And uh, we began by looking at the person of God and looking at His Word um, and looking at His decree and providence. And then we laid out these four columns and we've been working our way through the condition before the fall, after the fall, our present condition where the redemption that Christ accomplished on the cross uh, has been begun, or at least the effects of that, that redemption have begun to be seen. And uh, tonight we're going to take uh, a little while to think about the subject of the eternal state, um, which is a wonderful subject and uh, something that I hope will really warm our hearts and, uh, and cause us in our time of prayer tonight to be, um, to be f very full of praise and, and thanksgiving to the Lord because we're looking at that certain hope and future that Christ has purchased for us. Last time, you'll remember, um, what did we see that uh, in his uh, work on the cross, Christ actually redeemed? What was encompassed in that work of redemption? Man's heart. Absolutely right. So man was redeemed from this, this shame into which uh, the fall and his rebellion had cast him? Um, and was that the full extent then of, uh, of the work of Christ upon the cross to, uh, to bring man up out of the pit? Or was there more? Sean is nodding. There was more. Uh, what, else was, uh, what else was redeemed by Christ on the cross? What are the two words that uh, Scripture uses to talk about the, the scope of Christ's uh, redemption? Yeah. <coughs> I'll rub this out because it doesn't belong here, but all things. Do you remember that passage we read? where uh, the apostle, I think, used those words over and over and over again. All things, to bring together all things. Um, so not just mankind, um, but creation, which you remember we saw that what Adam did took the whole creation into a state of bondage to decay, uh, that the revelation of God that is, is still there, but it's marred by what Adam has done. Even now it is still in that bondage decay, to decay, but we learn from Romans 8 that um, the creation is groaning. And we learn that we, the, the redeemed of the Lord, are groaning as well. Uh, so the full realization is, is what we're going to be looking at tonight of the work that Christ did upon the cross. Let's spend a little while thinking about um, our, our entry into this uh, eternal state. Um, we've seen, I think we saw the passages last time around, that on the last day, um, if the Lord spares us on earth until then, uh, we're going to be changed. What, what kind of a change is going to happen to us? Those who remain until the Lord's coming. Um, how does Scripture describe what's going to happen to them or to us if the Lord should come? Ty? Rebirth. Rebirth? Rebirth. A new heaven and a new earth. 
a new heavens and a new earth. What, what's going to happen to us, though, the, the, the redeemed of the Lord? Okay, what, what kind of a change? No more decay. Okay. We have, uh, what we, have, we have already the redemption of our spirits. We, we saw that last time. What are we going to receive on, uh, on that day? We're going to receive glorified bodies. We're going to have the redemption of our bodies. We don't have that yet. So we're going to be given these glorified bodies, um, new bodies in a sense, but whose bodies will they be? Ours. Will, will, there in fa- will it in fact, will, will my glorified body be this body, glorified? Or will it be a totally dissociated body, fashioned anew, uh, this one will just get pushed out of the way and there'll be this, a, a new... It's, I know it sounds a bit funny, but it's, it's actually quite a serious question in terms of the implications. Will there be any connection between the body that I am in now and the body that I will receive on that day? And, uh, and the answer is yes. Otherwise, you wouldn't recognize me and that could be problematic or beneficial, depending <laughs> which way you look at it. There will be a link. The bodies that we have will be fashioned in what likeness? Sorry? In the likeness of Christ himself. Um, When he rose, he rose in a body that was recognizable when he chose to be recognized as the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was glorified. It was not uh, the same. It it had different characteristics in a way than than the body in which he was present for his ministry on earth. He was able to appear in locked rooms. And um, obviously, also, there was a certain glory about the body uh, so that... um, so that there was, a, there was a difference, even though it was clearly Christ and clearly the body of Christ. It was a glorious body. Uh, Paul tells us a little bit about this in 1 Corinthians 15. I'll read uh, verses 42 through 44. Talking about the resurrection of the dead and the body, it is sown a perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Uh, And then he goes on in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. And then he says also in in Philippians 3, verse 21, about the Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about how we are eagerly awaiting his coming. And he says that he will transform, transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. 
by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. And then uh, John, in 1 John 3 verse 2, says, <coughs> Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. So our entrance into this eternal state is going to be marked by the completion of the redemption. We have our redeemed spirits now. We are going to receive the redemption of our bodies. We are going to be glorified. But the bodies in which we will then exist throughout all eternity will be these bodies glorified. They won't be some uh, off-the-peg bodies that bear no relationship to the bodies in which we have dwelt here on earth. And these are glorious passages. Death is swallowed up in victory. Um, death that came in at the fall, now swallowed up in victory. Uh, because of what Christ has done on the cross. Let's think a little bit about what happens to the creation. Um, is there going to be a change to the created order on that day? And if so, yes there is. And if so, what, what's that going to be? What's that going to look like? Uh, what's going to happen according to Scripture, to, uh, to created things on that last day. The groaning will be finished. Something has to happen first, though, as the, en as the creation enters into the completion or, the, or the, uh, the redemption that Christ has accomplished going to be burned up. 2 Peter 3 verse 5, uh, reading through verse 7. Uh, For when they, say, when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. And then uh, down in 2 Peter 3 verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. So there's going to be a purging. And uh, whereas the earth was purged once with water, the purging that is going to take place uh, on that day will be by fire. Now, is this earth that we are standing on now going to be going to have anything to do with that earth uh, that will exist in the eternal state? Is there a link? Is it in fact this very earth that will sorry? Somehow. <laughs> Somehow. Um, and how do we know that there is a link? Ty. Scripture <coughs> says so. Um, David is God's word that shows these things. Um, is that what he was corresponding to that day? Okay. We know, we know that our bodies are going to be transformed. 
because of the work that Christ did and the redemption he accomplished, there is going to be a redemption of this body and the new body that I will receive, that we will receive in the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to be related. So from merely maintaining the parallel, um, if this creation is redeemed, it isn't so that it could be completely eliminated and, and something totally different and unconnected brought into place. Because then you would destroy that parallel. But the, the scriptures themselves, Sean, you were... Yes. Exactly right. The creation is groaning. And what, what's it groaning for? Freedom. It's not groaning for elimination. Um, and so that implies, more than implies, um, that it is this creation that is going to be purged. But, but it says it's going to be destroyed by fire. Isn't that a problem? Ty? Well, <coughs> what fire does to those is it purifies them. It certainly does. What does it say that was done to this world by water in the flood? It was destroyed. Is the world still here even <coughs> though it was destroyed? Um, in fact, I. Sean, you and I should do a study on this at some time, but in that passage in Peter, it talks about the destruction by water, and then it goes in and it talks about um, since everything will be destroyed in this way and so on and so forth, destroyed with intense heat. And the last word that's used for destruction, I was looking it up, it, it seems to have something to do with being liberated. It's like a, or, or loosed, uh, unbound. So it's almost like it's, it's a destruction through which it, it comes into this, this liberty. Uh, maybe there is some shade of that meaning there. Right. So there are passages in, in the Old Testament where the Lord declares the creation will endure uh, forever. So the parallel is there. We will be transformed and receive glorified bodies. The creation will be purged with fire and liberate, liberated and brought into, uh, into the freedom of the children of of God. Let's, let's take a look at what it's going to be like then. That's how we, that's, that's the transition that will take place. Um, let's take a look at what man will be like in the eternal state. Um, will the image of God be any clearer in man in the eternal state um, than it, will it be clearer than it was here after the fall? Will it be clearer than it is now for the redeemed sinner? Yes. Will it be clearer perhaps than it was even in Adam? I think uh, because of the glory um, that's, that's entirely possible. There is a um, there is a, there's a saying, or at least a, a scheme, as it were, of, of how man progresses through these four conditions. And it is that before the fall, man was able to sin. That was something that he was capable of. After the fall, but before being redeemed, man is not able not to sin is a slave to sin. In this condition, man is able not to sin, but still has a, a principle of sin within, and so he still stumbles and falls. But when you get to this condition, 
What's the story? Not able to sin. That's something to look forward to. Not able to sin. Yes. Right. So here, able to sin, able not to sin. Now, not able to sin. Why not able to sin? Ty. Of the redeemed, right. Well, they will, they will continue in this condition of not able not to sin. Um, <clears throat> but for those who the, whom the Lord has redeemed coming into this condition, they will not be able to sin. Can you imagine what that will be like? Not to be able to sin? because it won't be a part of our makeup anymore. How would God, looking upon man in that condition, what two words would God use to describe him? Very good. Now made fully like the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, what else would God say of him. <clears throat> there is a, there's a hymn that sadly is not in our hymn book um, where the hymn writer says um, in him, in Christ the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. In other words, in Christ we have been lifted to a higher place and greater privileges and glory than Adam knew. In him, in Christ, the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. So that is the, the kind of situation or what man is like in the eternal state. What will his position be? What will his position be in that state, Ty? Um, could you add another variation of very good? I could. It, it really I don't is, know if I should. Uh, I mean, pre-fall it was very good, but then in the eternal state... Oh, I see what you mean. So, Adam, not another... Right. Okay, very, very good. Not to be... <coughs> I was... Right. <laughs> very much better. Very much better than just good. <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. Um, and what are we going to be doing? What's our position going to be in glory? Where are we going to sit? Okay, on, on what will we sit? And we will sit with Christ where? On, at the table, on his throne, it says. I'm pretty sure that's true. And... Uh, in this eternal state, we will gain access to something that Adam forfeited for us. 
we turn to Revelation 22. Verse 1. Uh, John's revelation. Uh, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its street. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will, be, there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Um, they will reign with Christ. Uh, don't you know, says Paul, that you will judge angels? But what have we regained access to? What was it that, uh, that God cast Adam out of the garden so that he would not be able to eat from? The tree of life. And now here it is, and it is available to us to eat. There's another passage which we'll probably read a little bit later where it says, Now the dwelling of God is with man. Um, so that is a little bit about the position that we will have. What about um, the mandate that we have? Here we have this dominion. Here after the fall it becomes resisted. The ground produces thorns and thistles. We eat by the sweat of our brow. And we fulfill the mandate of, of um, procreation and so on and so forth through pain and through disease and difficulty. And that hasn't really changed. So what about the eternal state? It's interesting to think about this. What about filling the new heavens and the new earth? Is there a mandate to procreate? How do we know that? Ty? There won't be any uh, necessity to uh, be given in marriage. Right. Christ answered the, the Sadducees, didn't he? He had that yeah. conundrum for him about the seven brothers and the one woman. And he said, you're greatly in error because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Says we'll be like angels. There'll be no marriage or giving in marriage. So um, there will not be a mandate to fill. What about a mandate to subdue? Will we have to subdue the the new creation? What about a mandate to guard it? Who from? We will be there to worship the Lord, but I think the mandate will have significantly changed for us because we will have arrived at that summing up of all things under Christ, which was the whole purpose and the goal of creation, the glory of God and the summing up of all things under one head, which is Christ. So... Um, how do we put this man in relation to creation? Um, how about just the glory of God? And what about um, the heart of man? Our attitude, having received the redemption of our bodies uh, what is our entire motivation going to be? What will be our utter 
delight to praise God and to worship him. Willing, joyful, praise, and glory. <clears throat> okay, what will the new creation be like once that purging has happened? What is, what is the new creation going to become a home of? New heavens and a new earth in which, sorry? Right, the new Jerusalem. Okay, it is. It's going to be the new Jerusalem. Christ is going to be in the midst of her. Um, and what is in, uh, in 2 Peter 3, verse 13? According to his promise says Peter, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What would God think of a creation in which righteousness dwelt? How would he describe it? I don't know how many there is. <laughs> Very much better. Righteousness. Righteousness. Uh, this is a point where we should all turn to Revelation 21, and I think we have time to read it, because it really um, gives us such a wonderful description of the glory of of this new Jerusalem, this new creation that will be ushered in at that time. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Um, sea was a symbol of trouble and turmoil and distress. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Was that the case here? In the same way? Uh, no. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. 
having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it and the lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It's going to be glorious. Uh, obviously, much of this is figurative, but I imagine there are no words in our tongue that could begin to describe the glory um, of all that the Lord has prepared for us in this new creation. It will be very much better than anything that we can begin uh, to imagine. Eye has not seen or ear heard the things that God has prepared for us. So let's draw some principles out of here, um, out of what we've been looking at tonight. And they are these. At the appropriate time, God will purge this creation. He will make all things new Again, all will be restored. Everything will be very good. Again, the image of God in man will be restored. The image of God in creation will be renewed and restored. Man's heart will be completely undivided, uh, no longer any tendency to sin, not able to sin. He will delight in God and in obeying God. He will regain access to the tree of life, uh, that, that symbol of eternal life, will be his to eat from. He will inherit more blessings than Adam lost. That's amazing. But what does that have to do with the environment? Anything? Does that doctrine have anything to tell us about how we should deal with issues relating to the environment? We 
can trust God because it's a glorious future. Um, we're going to look next time about the things that we might do to, to arrest the world or the, the earth in its current bondage to decay. Maybe to overturn some of the things that fallen man in his greed has done to deface the image of God in this creation. But we should never take our eyes off the fact that God is going to actually purge this world with fire and produce something that is very much better than anything that we could accomplish. We shouldn't take our eyes off that. Um, we should have our focus very much on our inheritance, on our destination. Right. And so, not taking our eyes off the prize, but also not being disqualified in that current race. <clears throat> we can take for granted what our duty is even now to glorify God. Right. There's, there's a tension. Well, it's not a tension. What we're going to see next time here is that you have strands of the sovereignty of God and his eternal purposes for the things that he has created, which are to do with his glory. That's one thing. But then you have the responsibility of man in this created order, the dominion that God has given to him, and his uh, responsibility to exercise that dominion also for the glory of God. And we'll see that... He lost the ability at the fall to do it for the glory of God and to do it from a heart that was motivated by God's glory and that he has it back now in part and that therefore we are to do what we can to exercise the dominion that God has given us to the glory of God. But we are not to treat this creation as if this is our eternal dwelling place because it isn't. And we shouldn't make the mistake of, of, of living in this world as though this is our home. It's not. We're strangers and pilgrims here. And we need to have our eyes fixed on that better city, uh, the new Jerusalem whose architect and builder is God, not neglecting the responsibilities that we have that he's given us here. Um, but not forgetting that this is a very transient and very temporary circumstance in which we find ourselves. Any questions? Well, let's close in prayer then, shall we?